On February 24th, 2001, as a junior in college, I stepped onto stage to play uh, one of the best concerts of my life. And I always remember the date because it's right there on, on the shirt, so I can't forget it. But uh, it was with Bobby Watson, who is, hands down, one of the most impressive sax players I've ever heard in my life. He, uh, pick, the way he picks up the horn and just plays. And, and you know someone has mastered it when they just pick it up and do it, and they make it look easy, and they make it look fluid and just graceful, and you think everyone should be able to do that. He makes it look so easy. Except when you hear what he's playing, it is both bri brilliantly fast, but impressively melodic. I mean, he's just an amazing performer. In the lingo of musicians, dude has some chops. Dude can play, right? he's just amazing. Now, to walk onto stage playing in a jazz band that he was the, the fronting, he was the, the soloist, I, I knew that it was gonna be good, right? If I played my best, it was gonna be good. If I had the worst concert of my personal life, you know what it was gonna be? Good, and it wasn't gonna be, because it wasn't based on me. It was gonna be a great concert because Bobby was gonna do his thing, and, and I will happen to be on stage with him, right? I was playing with him, but just to be clear, we knew who the, the attraction was. I, I wasn't determining whether the concert was going to be great. And so in an odd sense, even though you're on stage, and, and there are, how many people can sit in Baldwin Hall up at Truman? That place was packed, right? In a very weird way, to, uh, to be in front of that many people and be playing, the pressure was off, right? I, the pressure wasn't on me, it was on Bobby, right? He was the one who was going to do amazing work. I, I just got to play. And in an odd sense, because it didn't matter how good I was or was not, I was freed, I probably, I think that might have been the best concert I've ever played. It just, no pressure, just go out and play. And I did, and it was awesome. I knew it was going to be good, uh, because I had chosen Bobby Watson. I ran a jazz festival at Truman uh, while I was in Phi Mu Alpha, the music fraternity there. And, and so I had chosen him. I, I had listened to him play. I knew that he worked really well with, with college groups and, and young, younger folk. And so I knew that he would be an amazing uh, performer and I knew he would be able to step in and make any concert great. And, and so as I did the publicity, uh, wearing the shirt around, going around, putting up uh, these really nice uh, posters, I still kept one, uh, putting these posters up all over town. Right? I knew it was going to be good, Go talking, doing the publicity, I, I had this confident hope that it was going to be a great concert because of Bobby doing his thing. Now, besides the joy of reminiscing about a great concert, I tell you about this jazz festival because it helps me think through this moment in which we live. Like, Advent is looking ahead. Advent, we're looking at when Jesus comes. And so, there's the time that Jesus came 2,000 years ago, and Jesus came and was born fully human, fully divine, disciples, Easter, resurrection. We have that whole story that Jesus came then. And that's the, then we have the, we know that Jesus is coming again on his way. Jesus will show up again. And so that's the, the second understanding of Advent. Jesus will come again. And, and then we're in between. How does Jesus come to us today? Uh, in this moment between the manger and, and the glory of the coming kingdom, where are we? It put a little bit more colloquially, if we're in between the warms and the fuzzies, shepherds, birth, manger, and, and the glory and the majesty, if we're in between, are we like somewhat warm and slightly majestic? A little bit fuzzy and a touch of glory? I mean, what, what, what does that mean to be in between those two ends? To me, it feels like those weeks before the concert with Bobby Watson, as I, I was headed towards something, but I wasn't there yet. I know it was coming, but, but I hadn't quite arrived. I knew Bobby was going to be amazing, and I was hoping it was going to be everything I expected it to be. And so I kept on uh, arranging the volunteers. We had, uh, I'd hired 12 judges. We had 42 bands coming in, high school bands, a multiple building event. And so I'm doing all these, taking care of all these details to prepare for what was coming and just pointing towards it and saying, it's gonna be good, here we go. 
We, we live in a time between. Jesus came once and Jesus will come again. We, we know that Jesus came once and he came at a specific time in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea. Herod was tetrarch of Galilee. His brother Philip was tetrarch of Ituria and Trachonitis. And Licinius was tetrarch of Abilene. Right? That, that's what we, we know that's when Jesus came the first advent. And, and we don't know when the, the, the last advent will be. Jesus tells us it's in uh, Matthew 24. But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father alone. And so we don't know the timeline on that when Jesus will come again. So we live this time in the time in between, the 15th year of Tiberius and God, God the Father only knows. And so we live in this time, and I think one of the ways we live in this time is as people of hope. People who are, and, and the nature of hope is that it's a very public thing. Like, I, I hope that Jesus is coming again, and I live based on that hope. And so if you ask me, like, what are you doing this weekend? I would tell you, I'm, I'm going to Columbia on Saturday, going to go see Santa, and then I'm going to go to church on Sunday. And, and that's a public statement. Like, if anyone asks you, what did you do on Sunday? You say, I go to church. And, and you are part of a public statement gathered here right now of our hope. We are here because we have a hope in Jesus. Christ. That, that's what it means to be gathered on, on Sunday. We have a hope that, that what Jesus says is, is true. And because we have this hope, it shapes how we live our lives, not just on Sunday, but think of all the things that happen through the week that are only done because we have this hope. This hope has a certain confidence to it as well. Jesus changed the world when he came once before. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And Jesus changed the world once. And Jesus will definitely change the world when he comes a second time. And so since Jesus changed the past and has determined the future, we live as a people of hope that is confident that Jesus can change today. But walking on the stage that night to play that concert... I was hoping it was going to be really good based upon who Bobby Watson is, right? That, that's the hope. And so it, it changes how you walk on stage, right? You're, you're not kind of nervous. You walk on stage because you know it's going to be good, so you don't exactly saunter, but you're not worried about it. Right? And the same, if you've ever been on a football team, I imagine it must be similar to walking on the field when you know you have your game plan down and, and you trust your line and you know your QB is good and you, you trust your receivers, like to walk on the field knowing it's going to be good. How, how do you walk on that field? Are you nervous? Or you just go and you do it. You get to go play. So based on this hope we have, we are both uh, public about it and confident about it. Because we know that it is going to work out. Not because of who we are, but because of who Jesus is. And we are confident that it's going to work out in a certain way as well. We read in Jeremiah 9 that, uh, Thus says the Lord, Let not a wise man boast of his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth. For I delight in these things, declares the Lord. And knowing this, we may find ourselves not worrying so much about our might, our riches, and instead seeking justice and righteousness, making things right, because that is what delights God, and that is what will happen in the end. That is the fruit of our hope. We might find ourselves doing things we would never have expected, because our hope is that that is where we're going, so we start living into it today. This hope that is public and confident has a courageousness to it, it also has an element of stubbornness. To say that when Jesus comes, all things will be made right. To be an ambassador of Jesus Christ, as Paul lays out it's in 2 Corinthians 5, to be sent as ambassadors of reconciliation, is to know that everyone you meet is made in the image of God and thus redeemable. Right? It's, it's, everything we touch is inherently good. And we can touch things and say, these are gods. This is redeemable. This can be made right. We can meet people and say, God loves you. And this can be turned around, no matter how badly a life is messed up. Right? This can be made right. Because we have hope in what God is going to do. This Christian hope 
It is our response to two of the temptations of the day. One temptation of this day is cynicism, right? It's as good as it's going to be, nowhere to go but down. I can't do anything about it, so I might as well lay back and just kind of enjoy the best I can, right? Cynicism that can lend into sort of, lead into sort of a hedonism as well, right? It, cynicism that denies that we're going anywhere, that denies that we have any hope. And on the other side of cynicism, the other temptation of the day is the temptation to say, I can do it all myself. Like, I can make it all better, and it depends on me, and if I just work hard enough, I can fix it. This is the temptation of a lot of pastors, to be honest. Right? If I just work harder, I can make it all right. right? It's the Protestant work ethic gone wrong. Right? If I just work harder, I can, I can do it all. It's nice that we need God's help, because in the end, it fails. In a world that lives between these two temptations, that everything is falling apart in a cynical doom, and that we can fix it ourselves if we just try harder, we are people of a third way, a people of hope. And this is confusing to others. Right? We have hope. So the people who are cynical say, why do you have hope? And we say, Jesus Christ. Jesus got over being dead. We have hope. There's no bigger problem than that. And for those who are trying to work their ways, just we can fix it if we just try hard enough, we say, we have hope in Jesus Christ. And so we don't have to build it all. We don't have to make it all right. And to the people who think we do have to make it all right, we look, well, lazy. I don't have to fix it all. I have hope. For Christians, we are being saved and being saved daily. We are forgiven, accepted, and loved. And as people who live in this time between when Jesus came once and when Jesus will come again to make it all right and good and true, in this time marked by hope of where we're going, there is nothing we have to do. Now, we talk about the gift of forgiveness and the gift of salvation. Like, when you open a gift, you have to like, respond and prove that you're worthy. Right? There's no like check mark to, to prove that you're good enough to receive this gift. You, you accept a gift and you say thank you, and that's it. Given a gift. There is nothing we have to do. We can sit back and do nothing from here until the end of our lives, and that will not change that the kingdom of God is coming. We could do nothing, but wouldn't that be boring? Right? I didn't have to walk on stage with Bobby Watson. I didn't need to be in the jazz band. Like I, I didn't need to. I didn't need the credit hours. I didn't have to do that. But I got to. Like, why wouldn't I? I get, I got, I, can, I get to walk on stage with him what, and play that? That is amazing. Why wouldn't I? I have the same uh, uh, sense of when it comes to preaching. Like, I, I don't have to preach. You might not know that. I don't have to preach for a living. There are a lot of other ways I could make a living. Right? And some of them would even be a little bit lower stress. But I get to preach. I don't have to preach. I get to preach. And how? It would be boring not to preach. Like, I get to preach, and it is amazing. That's the sense uh, that we're talking about here. Like, we live in a time that's marked, we're, we're marked by hope, in between when Jesus came and Jesus will come again. And, and we don't have to do follow Jesus. We've accepted baptism. We've accepted forgiveness. That's it. Wash our hands. Kick back. We could do that, but we get to follow. We get to accept baptism and be part of this amazing thing called church. We get to come to this table and accept what Jesus offers here. We get to follow Jesus. And because we get to follow Jesus and we know that the future is in his hands, we get to follow Jesus with a certain sense of time. We know that we have the time to do things like have children and have families and pursue arts and create what is beautiful and to be part of a community together because we don't have to fix it all. We get to follow. We'll do what we can. We get to do it joyfully. But we can face the future without fear, without cynicism, and without thinking it all depends upon us. We face the, f we face the future without fear because we know the punchline that we live in this time in between. That Jesus came once and he will come again. And that in this time in between, we live as a people of hope. A public, courageous, and stubborn hope. As a people of hope, we don't have to do anything. Instead, we get to follow Jesus. Thanks be to God. Amen.